Okay, so uh, welcome to this webinar about portfolio management during crisis. That's uh, number two. Uh, I didn't want to do like a, a stupid title, just literally trying to help you uh, during these difficult times. And when I say that, it's difficult for everyone. Uh, and before thinking about portfolio management, we should be thinking about our own uh, safety, health, and everything. So I hope all of you are safe and life uh, and life is okay because um, those are uh, tough times so um we did i did uh, a similar um webinar last week uh, where the idea is to go through the different asset classes uh, and trying to go through the different points that could be interesting for you um, and then trying as well to answer uh, questions that you might have so I would like to start first with a situation across asset classes, like the way we did last week. And I think, as I mentioned, uh, what is really important is the credit market. Um, really, the risk uh, is on the credit market. Uh, and I want to spend a bit more time on this. And the developments that we had across uh, uh, as well, I mean, I should say between the US and, and, and Europe with the ECB and the Fed have shown that actually the credit market was really, really struggling. So, so let, let, let's start with the market. And, and when I say the market is, is the stock market, um, very quickly, um, the market is, is for, for those of you who have done the mentoring and, and, and have done the videos, I think the market is still a bit short gamma. We have, Instead of having the, the quadruple reaching of last week, we have two more, the weekly, um, the weekly uh, expiry. Um, so what we had over the last three days uh, since, uh, since Monday is, is a big rally. Uh, and that has been helped by different factors that we'll try to, to cover. I mean, that's the easy part, which is, um, which is back trading and and that was the jokes one of the jokes jokes what uh, that we were making uh, when i was in the trading room is you know back trading is always easy you always be making money when when you back trade okay so that's the easy one that's the easy part for me to do um so market has been has been really strong what we could have now is in, in the near future is some is some resistance uh why because we had this massive sell-off now we had, uh, um, let's say, uh, one third uh, uh, correction or reversion to the mean, but now the fundamentals really matter. Okay, so uh, just quickly looking at this slide, which, which I like some of you have access to this Excel spreadsheet, is looking at the SP and the 11 sectors in the SP to try to understand what is leading the market at any point in time. So if we look since we last spoke, um, last, uh, last Thursday, the market is up 8%. In between, I mean, it went down 10, 15%. So that tells you about, you know, by how much volatile the market is. But I think what is, in, what is interesting is to understand what is making the moves inside the S&P and what is making the moves inside, inside the benchmark. And as you can see, the big uh, outperformer is the energy and the industrial, but really, energy and that tells you that actually uh, the dogs the underperformers that we had over the last six weeks did well uh, um, this week so that is interesting that tells you that uh, uh, the rally is is partly about short covering uh, people that have been making good money on on some short like the energy or some industrial are covering part of their shorts but at the moment, uh, um, the leaders that we had before are not making the whole story. So what I would like for us to do now is, is jumping quickly into some charts and, and trying to do the same asset class that we've done before. Um, so first, I would love for us to be uh, looking at, at this chart, which is the, um, um, the S&P move versus the high yield uh, uh, ETF, which is the uh, HYG. Uh, and in orange, you get the S&P. And you can see the strong correlation that we had over the last five days. Uh, and why? Because as you know, 
on, 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 on Monday, the Fed came with a big bazooka. So last week when we discussed, we, I was pretty bearish. Why? Because I think that the Fed, uh, even if it was intervening, I think it was too small. And since then, because the credit market was really, really struggling and, and in complete turmoil, uh, they decided on Monday to announce um, uh, Infinite QE, uh, which is a uh, Japanese style, which tells you about um, the state of the credit market. Uh, so they are using this big bazooka. And since then, uh, the whole credit market, the whole risk on has been working well. And there, is massive, there has been massive correlation. Um, so they announced, uh, so if we go back into, uh, if I managed to do it, if we go back into um, my, ex okay, here, my PowerPoint. Uh, so Fed is, the Fed is in the place. Um, so the first try that we uh, covered last week is they announced that they were doing uh, uh, something like 200, 500 billion or government bonds, and and um, and here it's a bit blurry, but 200 billion of, of, of MBS, mortgage patched securities. And on Monday, um, again, they announced this big bazooka saying, you know, in the amounts needed to support smooth market functioning and effective transmission of monetary policy to broader financial conditions in the economy. So that tells you what, that tells you this is Q infinity, and there is no limit for their books, uh, which is extremely impressive. Um, and last week, we already covered that uh, on, on, that was on Thursday when the ECB came with a small bazooka because the Europeans were are always doing things in, in a, let's say, in a smaller size. But that was the first part of central banks really pushing hard. Why? Because um, the BTP, the Italian 10 years, was really struggling. Uh, it was trading at one, I think, 23. Last Thursday, it closed to the at around 142 or, or more. Uh, and actually, the, the spread between the German 10 years and the Italian 10 years, between the Bund and the BTB, is now back to where it was before, almost before the crisis. But that tells you about the size of what the Fed is doing. So this week, the Fed will be buying 75 billion in treasuries and 50 billion of uh, mortgage backed uh, mortgage -backed securities every day for the rest of the week. So to give you an indication that's roughly over six to seven days, the size of what the ECB announced last week with the 750 billion uh, um, QE. So make no mistake, you know, if people are telling you um, um, that the market was doing fine, was just, you know, coronavirus, blah, blah, blah. Risk on, risk off. You get massive risk on on the day that the Fed announced, which is on Monday. And you can see the bottom on Monday of all risky assets. And since then, we have been moving up because the Fed is in town and is buying everything and is doing all the dodgy things that you can find. So what you had last week is literally, if you were holding bonds, if you were running some ETFs, there was no bid in the market. So there was no price discovery. And when I say no price discovery, that means huge dislocation. And now the Fed is more or less at the bid and saying, look, hit me and I can have, I can take whatever you give me, uh, which is pretty uh, honored in terms of size. Uh, uh, so we'll be looking at the, ban the, the, the Fed balance sheet. So, as I mentioned last week, these days, what you, we all need to be doing is following the announcement of, of, of central banks. Uh, if we think about um, uh, the, the Fed here, um, so um, we need to be checking their website and you need as well to be checking uh, the New York Fed website, which is offering all the, uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the size that, uh, the Fed is actually buying every day, so that's extremely helpful. And for you every day now in the next 10 days, you need to be checking uh, the muni market, the mortgage backed securities and the commercial mortgage, because this is where the stress is in the market. This is where the, the stress started. So again, the equity market, this is the volatile wine, but actually the credit market was much more volatile. So 
check those markets, show the, check this, uh, uh, this muni market, which uh, has been really struggling, the mortgage-backed securities and the, uh, and the commercial mortgage. So on the mortgage rates, um, so this is one of the credit market that really str struggled last week. Uh, so a mortgage rates, they borrow short-term to buy long-term MBS. Okay, the problem appears when the short-term borrowing, uh, the cost of it are skyrocketing. And that means you are not, they are not in a position uh, through the repo or short-term borrowing to have access to the market. Uh, and you have names like IVR, NIYMT, TRTX that just plunged. So you can check after this call about the price action. Why? Because there has been a massive distress in this space and the, the Fed had to jump quickly into that space because what you don't want to be uh, uh, seeing as a central bank is a domino effect. So when you have a stress somewhere in the market and it's spreading into all other asset classes. Um, so um, again, the 75 billion plus 50 billion agency uh, MBS, uh, this is just stunning numbers. That is quite scary. Um, that, is, that is pretty on earth. Um, so if you look at the chart of, of some of one of the stock that I mentioned, which is IVR, uh, Invesco Mortgage Capital, you can see the drop. Um, but that tells you again that there is part of the market that uh, uh, really was suffering. Uh, one of the other markets that we all need to be checking, which is uh, for the banks, which is um, uh, the spread between uh, uh, the, F, uh, the FRA and the OIS, which is the uh, we have a question. Do you expect a lower low at least a weakness since economy? Okay, we'll, I'll answer that question at the end of the call. So this chart, I, I strongly advise you to be following um, uh, marketeer.com on, on, on Twitter, which is offering a lot of, of charts, content, and actually what you should be looking at any point in time. They are extremely helpful. Uh, but that's here, the chart of the FRA versus the uh, OIS. And that tells you about this is the proxy to understand how costly it is for a bank to borrow in the future. So the, the FRA is the forward rate agreement, where, which is the key rate for, for the banks over the next three months, whereas the OAS is the overnight index swap rate, which is literally the short term. So when you have a, a widening of the spread, that means there is stress. And obviously what the Fed doesn't want to see is something like this. So they will jump and they will try to reduce uh, uh, this, this spread. Similarly, that's uh, something that I just mentioned. Uh, if you have access to FRED, and we all have access to FRED, so you should open an account and, and, and collecting data, free data, you can see uh, the FED balance sheet. So the FED balance sheet is now making new, new uh, all time high. Uh, so now it's almost at 5 billion. Uh, they are probably it's going to be at 6 billion very quickly. And there are talks that it's going to go uh, quickly to 8 trillion, okay? 8 trillion is just a, a, a crazy number, but that tells you about, you know, uh, uh, the, you know the, the, the problem that we have been facing. As I've been saying, look at the Fed of New York and what is, uh, so they will give you uh, for any single day what QE repo they will be doing. So you know that for this week, uh, which explain a lot about this rally that we had across asset classes. The Fed is in town and the Fed is in town for 650 billion, which is absolutely insane. And so we had this massive rally that was helped by the Fed and some of the factors that we will try to identify. But again, go on those websites on the Fed and the New York Fed, um, that is extremely helpful. You can either, uh, even uh, put in your address and being on their mailing list. Um, and you get access in the near future. So let's go back to, to the asset classes and what we had over the week. So as I mentioned, if we look at uh, this, the, um, here, this is the Italian 10 years versus, let me kill this one, the Italian 10 years versus the uh, US 10 year, uh, the uh, boon, sorry, uh, it came back to low level. And that was the first move from central banks, which was the, the first significant move which was done last Thursday. And at the same time last Thursday, uh, the Fed announced their uh, uh, dollar swaps with, uh, I think it was eight central banks. 
And since then, the dollar has been weakening. So if you look at the euro dollar since last week, literally the bottom was done last week. That's the same for, for uh, uh, the sterling against the dollar. So if you add position, add some long dollar uh, versus sterling, I started uh, to close that position uh, at the end of last week. Why? Because there was an abnormal uh, uh, move um, and, and, and the swap announcement was pretty significant. Then, as I said, on Monday, the big bazooka, which is the, the QE infinity. So that shows that the dollar, again, uh, uh, picked uh, uh, last Thursday or Friday. And since then, the Fed had managed to do something that it is paid for, which is providing liquidity in the system and providing dollar in the system. I'm a bit more struggling with the concept of QE because the concept of QE is more or less bailing out people these days that are in big trouble. Okay, so if you are found, if you are a rich, whatever, you just that um, the Fed is jumping and you can put whatever price you want, they will be buying. And that is, to me, that is a bit of a struggle uh, because I don't think this is the role of the Fed to, to be doing that and especially in, in such a, a, a big size. So credit, we have covered credit a bit. I think we you really need to be looking more into credit. Uh, that is really where the risk is. For uh, 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 currencies, um, we had a big bazooka used by the Fed. If we carry on from um, um, into um, commodities, which is the third, asset classes, I think what, what is telling me that the market is far from being safe is, is uh, WTI. Okay, so that's the chart of WTI. So we all know, as, a, as I mentioned last week, that WTI is 100 million supply, 100 million demand in a normal world. What we have these days is these 100 million demands collapse to 80 million. So we had 10 to 20 million demand less of WTI. And actually the Saudi story is about increasing the production is almost meaningless because these 20 million represent, you know, the, ag uh, the aggregate production of uh, Russia plus uh, the Saudis. But what you have is the across asset classes and, and let's say RISCON and even the XLE, which is the oil sector, it bonds but not the WTI, okay? WTI is still pretty weak and the price action is, is, is weak versus any other asset class. Um, and, and literally this is a one to monitor to see if we're gonna break this 20 level. Uh, if we break this 20 level, I could see the whole market uh, uh, going for another leg down, especially uh, as it will uh, 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 imply uh, some stress in the high yield uh, market uh, uh, for, uh, for the oil sector. So keeping in mind that the oil sector is, 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 is a small market now in terms of size, but that could have domino effect on a portfolio. So if you have a portfolio of 100 assets and five to 10, five, 10 assets, which are the oil are uh, uh, struggling, then that means you probably need to do a bit of uh, space on, on, in your portfolio. So. The gold, uh, I mean, you probably read about the story about um, uh, uh, there was a shortage of, of, uh, of physical delivery. So <laughs> because retail people, literally people in the streets were buying gold and needed uh, gold, uh, people had to be buying the future just to get the delivery. So we had a, a, a massive short uh, squeeze from, I think it was Monday, uh, on, on this physical delivery. And actually, uh, um, the, uh, uh, now they are making an April contract, which will give you more ability to get physical uh, um, delivery. So that's for the gold. Uh, Palladium, um, which is, you know, kind of a good um, example of what happened in Wisconsin. Wiscoff is, is back to, um, uh, to an interesting level now. Uh, copper. So copper has not really bounced. So in terms of copper and, and, and WTI, which are really a good indication of how the real economy is doing, nothing is bouncing. So the real economy <laughs> is gonna suffer in the next uh, two to three months for sure. 
So currencies, as I discussed, I mean, all the currencies have been bouncing versus the dollar. Um, so currency, commodities, uh, and we've done a bit of, uh, of market, uh, stock market, and we're gonna do more in the, in the next uh, half an hour. So let's go back to, um, to this, if I managed to do it. Okay, I was struggling, too many things here. Where is my, up. Okay. So something that I mentioned last week, which was um, the size of the fiscal stimulus. So the fiscal stimulus that we need to put in context versus the possible loss of GDP. So last week we were discussing 1.1.3 trillion uh, fiscal stimulus and last night they, uh, so the, uh, they voted for 2 billion fiscal stimulus, which represents roughly 10% uh, uh, GDP down on the year. So if you take roughly 20 trillion GDP in 2019 for the US GDP, and against that you're going to put 2 trillion, that gives you 10%, and then you have to do the math. So in terms of, of mathematics, that will give you Q2 uh, down 30% and the Q3 down 10%. But I think what is important to keep in mind is it's only to fill the gap. Okay, this is nothing to do to be a kind of six months or 12 months ago, which was to have the economy still being uh, and still going. So careful here, it is filling the gap. And there was some misleading headline from Kudlow saying, you know, it's gonna be a six trillion package. It's not a six trillion package, it's a two trillion fiscal package which is done through, uh, um, uh, through the, uh, the Trump administration. And then you have a four trillion package, which is not, which is mostly about the Fed helping the market. But actually, if you want to be a bit sarcastic, you can say that uh, Wall Street is gonna get two or three times more than Main Street, okay? Um, so I think at one stage, um, they will have to pay to pay it back because it can't work like this to tell people, look, we're gonna do four to six billion through the Fed and two trillion uh, through fiscal stimulus. Um, so today, today, US unemployment, initial claims. Um, so initial claims went through three billion and above. Um, and actually yesterday I work on, uh, on this, when I work on the webinar, uh, one of my ex-mentees uh, kindly uh, sent me an article and, and that was the expectations uh, of, of possible job losses based on uh, social distancing. And uh, so if you take the, labo the labor force, which stands at 164.5 million, roughly, you can have the best case scenario, which is 20% unemployment uh, with 27 million. Uh, uh, so you're gonna have 27 million jobs that could be destroyed because of, of social distancing. So that puts you into 20% unemployment. And if you take the worst case scenario, you end up with uh, uh, 67 million jobs that could be destroyed. And that gives you a 43% uh, um, uh, unemployment. So. Why you want to say that? Because if you take the only the average of those two, which is 30%, this is why you end up with the bullard numbers, which was saying the Fed was saying that we're going to have quickly a 30% unemployment rate. The, the whole question here is, it's not necessarily about this chart sh shooting up, okay? Because as you know, NFP job numbers are lagging indicators. So we all knew since uh, uh, the social distancing and, and, and the lockdown has been in place, that we will uh, uh, um, um, see many, uh, a big jump in US unemployment. So literally people that were just, you know, if you were looking at Twitter for two hours, you get uh, this chance chart, which was this one, the initial claims. And I just put it because I don't care at the end of the day. I do care, but you know, it's, it, it's already, we, we knew about it, okay? And, and I know some of you are going to hate me today, but if you look at the price action today, and this is very similar to trading the NFP numbers on the first Friday of each month, uh, which I never do. I, I literally, if you have been trading for long enough, you 
rarely do it because there's a lot of noise. But if you look at the price action and here, okay, don't, don't shoot the messenger because, uh, um, and again, it's easy to do, be doing back trading, but the announcement was done at 8.30, which was at the low of the day on the future. And literally it's after that, we moved like almost 200 points, which is, you know, seven to 8%. So I think the struggle here is we all know now for the last four weeks uh, and, and four weeks ago, the guys who were telling, you know, it's only the flu started to, to think as well that uh, uh, something had to change. Um, so for the last four weeks, we know that the economy is going to suffer big time. So the numbers that we're going to see in the futures, the economic numbers that we're going to see in the near futures are going to be horrible. They're going to be very, very bad. So, but if the market is down 34, so let's say 30%, something has been priced. I'm not saying that everything is priced because actually, if you remember last week, I think the market could go lower. Uh, but what you had between last week and this week is the Fed on Monday came and say, I'm all in. So do you want to play against the Fed now, which is putting liquidity? You need to look at the calendar of the liquidity. You know that starting from next week, actually the liquidity is going to dry up a bit because the Fed is not going to be as much as it was in the market. Okay, but be careful of not uh, trading the headlines here, uh, at least the headlines on the economic numbers. Uh, I think the most significant headline that you should be trading is uh, the coronavirus one way or another. And obviously, if you start to see a, a, a reduction of the logarithmic chart that we have, uh, uh, in Europe and more importantly in the US these days, that will help massively. And this is what you're going to be looking in the next two to three weeks in the US. So US unemployment, but just to, uh, to give you a chart, what could be the US unemployment rate in the next couple of months? Okay, so if we take the assumption that we're going to 20%, this is where we are. If you go into 40%, so suddenly your chart looks absolutely ridiculous. The whole question is for how long. If it's only, let's say, two or three months, I mean, it's extremely painful, but I think we can recover quickly. But if, uh, quickly is a big word. But uh, otherwise, you know, it's going to be extremely painful. And here you have the benchmark. What is the benchmark is what is happening in China, what is happening in Italy, what is happening in those countries. It takes probably two months of lockdown. Then it takes a lot of time to come back to work. If you look at China, 20, 30% of the economy is only working, or let's say 50% at best. And even if we don't know the numbers and we cannot rely on the numbers. So here, be careful on the expectation. So I would like as well today to spend a, a, a bit more time on the VIX, okay? Why I want to be spending a bit more time on the VIX um, because volatility is key. So volatility has been jumping massively across asset classes. So the VIX is the implied volatility that is priced by options on the S&P 500 for the next 30 days. So 30 days implied volatility for the S&P 500. So why I want to do that? Because every day I get questions and people telling me, I want to be long the VIX, short the VIX, what's the volatility, blah, blah, blah. And I'm hearing that people are telling or you should be selling your options, you should be selling uh, volatility. And I'm like, mm, okay, that was, those are the people probably that never traded volatility. But more importantly, I think what you should keep in mind is if someone is telling you that the VIX is going down by 25% one day, it just doesn't understand what is VIX. VIX is implied volatility. So when it goes from 70 to 60, that means the implied volatility goes from 70% to 60%. Not that it's down whatever percent, okay? But you need to understand what is the VIX. So from 2010 to 2019, we had a very little jump in, 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 in the VIX. So if we look at the next chart, that is the VIX since its creation, you can see some kind of oscill oscillation, which is actually very similar, if you think about it, about the economic cycle, okay? And uh, uh, each time the economy is doing fine, the VIX is at low level. Then when you have recession, you have the VIX jumping. Here, this is where is the VIX. This is the great financial crisis. 
and in between you don't have you have some spikes which are more or less every six to twelve months you have some sell-off in the market so looking back at the previous uh, uh, um, uh, spreadsheet i looked at 2008 2009 as one of the let's say benchmark not the benchmark but um helping me understand and, and probably helping you understand how the volatility is working. So since its creation in 1991, the VIX is averaging 19.3%, 19.3%. From August 2008 to August 2009, literally during the great financial crisis, the VIX averaged roughly 41%. Okay, so this is your benchmark. Versus that, since 1945, when you have a peak to through GDP contraction, you get it lasts 11 months. So imagine that the coronavirus is creating the end of the economic cycle. Okay, that, 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 that must be quite crazy to think that after 11 years of economic cycle, uh, such a big catalyst could provoke a recession, right? And probably even a depression. If that happens, that means what? That means in the next 10 to 12 months, we can see very high volatility. So be careful on, you know, betting on the volatility being a one-off for two months. Vol high volatility could stay here for longer. And if you think, if you look at a day like today, actually after the call, you could check, uh, market is up six, 7%, 6%. And in the meantime, the implied volatility uh, uh, the VIX is, is, is small, is only a small down. So why? Because there is still a lot of stress in the system. So the VIX, let's look at the structure of the VIX um, and, and how the different uh, futures contract have been trading recently. So you have the spots, you get the different uh, month contract and here you get the contract is called to be in backwardation because the price of the future contracts are lower than the spot. And that gives you the VIX structure. So if you take, that was a couple of hours ago, if you take uh, 25.56 on the S&P with the spot of the VIX at 60%, that tells you about an implied move priced by the market at 97 points on one day, for one day, 214 points and 446. So every day you should expect roughly 100 points move. So if you, uh, if you follow the VIX and, 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 um, and you look at the standard deviation, that will translate with a 95%, which is two standard deviation, those, those implied moves. So one day, 3.8%, 95%, 7.6%. So these days you have the market that is pricing moves between five to 10%. Okay, so this is something that I covered uh, in the videos of uh, in the four by four video series, which I uh, uh, there is a long videos on on implied volatility and realized volatility and really understanding how it works and what is the VIX. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, my mentees have done well, uh, partly because of understanding implied volatility. So the VIX, like in this chart, you can see. Uh, in blue, the realized volatility, which is here. In orange, which is the VIX, which, uh, 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 which is the implied volatility. And in gray, you have the, uh, uh, the implied versus the realized. You can see that these days, the realized volatility has been higher than the implied volatility, which really happens when there is a lot of stress in the system. So look at the VIX look at the structure don't assume that the vix is gonna uh, move down big time or going up big time be extremely extremely careful here about trading volatility and when i say trading volatility why i say trading volatility because people are trading options okay so some of you think that what you need to be doing as a trader you need to be flexible so six weeks ago trading volatility was perfect why because you could you could have been buying many strategies hedging your book with implied volatility at 15. Now, if you tried implied volatility at 60%, if you hedge your book at 60%, if you take direction at 60%, it's extremely hard 
to handle. So you better, you know, you better switching your exposure from options into cash and being smaller into the cash. And please don't sell me the story about I heard someone who sell, you know, option, who sell uh, options, uh, who sell premium. This is complete bullshit. If you do that, you put your whole portfolio at risk. There is unlimited downside for those strategies. I've, as I've said last week, I've seen too, too many people uh, literally blowing up their accounts doing so. So, but I think what is interesting uh, for this week, um, looking back on, on the S&P, and I would like quickly to look at, at the chart of the S&P. Uh, let's put the S&P, the move that we had uh, from the lows. Uh, so we had here the Fed that uh, is coming and on the 23rd that helped massively the market. We had uh, what we call the dark pools that have been buying the market quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, tomorrow we get uh, the OPEX, uh, the, the expiry, and this is why in my uh, uh, in the previous in the chart that I showed you, I wanted to show you every week you should be looking at the open uh, interest uh, um, on on the um, on the S and P and on stocks and and trying to to see what are the significant open interest. So the market as I said into, in my introduction, was still short gamma. Uh, despite all of this, the market uh, went into a, a massive short quiz. Um, there's, uh, if you look at 2550, uh, if I can do it, can I do it? Uh, 2550, uh, sorry. So your 2550 here, there is no imbalance between uh, the call and the bid, so there is no real open interest. Uh, 2600 uh, looked like it was a big magnet. If we go back into the chart, and I think some of you uh, asked me uh, through questions, um, on a daily chart, if you look at uh, the Fibonacci retracement, which is something that is a bit dodgy and doesn't work that much, but sometimes, you know, when you're trying to find some level, you can see that 2650 is the big level. Otherwise, you go into 2700, 2800. What I like to do is you need to shorten your time frame looking at charting. And, and if you look at, the, uh, at an early basis chart, you can see here, so that's the S&P, that's the cash. So above 2630, uh, uh, there is not, not much before 2730, okay? So if tomorrow, uh, 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 we managed to go higher. There's another 100 points uh, 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 to take. I think it's going to be hard unless we get a big news overnight uh, uh, to be moving much, much higher. But look, the price action is extremely important. You always have to respect the price action. Uh, and this week, you know, uh, uh, as I said, if you look at the long term chart of the SP, I, I still want to believe that the only strong support is at 15.80, okay. Uh, but here we are talking Armageddon. The Fed did the job that he has to do, which is providing liquidity through dollar, through uh, helping the credit market. The size of the QE tells you about in which kind of stress the whole market was, okay. so. Looking back at an early chart, this is the picture. This is where we are here. If you look at the volumes today that we had, uh, the rally was strong, but the volumes were uh, uh, um, a bit light. So there is less conviction than before. Um, I think what is interesting as well is, again, for me, WTI is not um, jumping much higher. Um, um, and I agree 2650 uh, could be a good level uh, um, um, to uh, as a short now. Um, so why as well the market did well? Uh, there is always factor. So last week we we looked at uh, the quadruple reaching and saying um, after the quadruple reaching there is always a chance that uh, uh, on the Monday on the Tuesday the market reversed um, and the market reversed not because of the gamma, but reverse literally because of the Fed and the QE. So, but still, you know, 
you need to be looking at those possible um, indicators, the possible, um, let's say, catalyst in the market. So one of the catalysts that we have now, we are at the end of the month of March, meaning end of the month and end of the quarter. So there is this, um, uh, for some of you, maybe you know, which is uh, um, uh, rebalancing at the end of, of the quarter and end of the month. What is rebalancing? Uh, the rebalancing, the concept is if you are a mutual fund and you own, let's say, 60% of bonds and 40% of equities, at the end of each month, you need to rebalance to the 60 and 40%. So if you think about what happened this month, which is on the 28th of February, and I took the Bloomberg Barclays US Treasury total return on edge, so you can find here. I strongly advise you to run an Excel spreadsheet of you know, historical data to see how it works. But the idea is if one of the two underperformed massively on the month on the quarter, either equity or bond, there's gonna be a reversion to the mean until the end of the month. And very often what happens because mutual funds are so, so big, is it's gonna start five days, five sessions before the end of the month. So if we look at this month on the 28th of February, this is the close of the Bloomberg Barclays US Treasury. So bonds were up 2%, whereas the, uh, in the meantime, that was uh, um, an hour ago, the S&P was down 12%. But if you do the same on the 24th, actually the market was, was down uh, for the equity 16 to 20%. So what mutual funds have to do is the size of their bonds were bigger versus equity. So they had to buy equities just to go back into the 60, 60 to 40%. So you have this, um, let's say, force buyers uh, just to rebalance their book. And this is uh, one of the reasons the market has been so strong this week and probably could be strong until the end of the month. So if you think about it, there has been many factors this week for the equity market to be strong. The first one is the Fed and the central banks, which have massively. You have the dark pools, you have the end of the month strategies, um, and all of this is helping the market, help the market to go higher. But starting next week, the Fed is still gonna be in turn, but not as much as it was this week. The end of the month strategy is going to run away and you start to see the headlines of real economic numbers. So keeping in mind that the real economic numbers, again, we all know that it's going to be Armageddon. Uh, so be careful on, on, on not uh, playing those, those numbers too much. Um, very quickly, sorry to bother about this 4x4 video series. Uh, this is what you have in the 4x4 video series. And, and why I want to underline this is um, both what is happening today, understanding why is the GDP uh, uh, made of the components, the drivers, very important. And I think it's helping many people here is the asset allocation versus the economic cycle. And that's going to be key in the next 18 months. Why? Because if we are going into a recession, and I think strongly believe that that is the case, or depression, it's going to last 12 to 18 months and you need to allocate your money differently between asset classes and, and sectors. Um, as I've done today, there is a big part about expected returns versus realized returns through the VIX, Black and Shorts and Options. Uh, why? Because again, volatility in a time like this is fundamental and understanding volatility is key for you to build your portfolio or trading. In terms of macro analysis, that is, again, it's not because all the numbers will be dreadful. Uh, it is about building your infrastructure and trying to look for what's going to happen next. In terms of ID generation, I know that many of you are struggling, and this is the next part that we're going to do through, the, uh, through trying to answer your questions, is trying to generate IDs. And I don't want you to be stuck in, in some top-down a screening that works for maybe uh, some time, but then you, you're stuck. So you need to be able to do bottom-up special situation and active trading. And when I say that, because I've done both, I work for a hedge fund where I was doing between one day and three to five years uh, uh, um, uh, portfolio management. And when I was a prop trader, when my strategy was between one minute and one to two months. So you need to have both 
if you want to survive any market condition. I think what is extremely important as well and where you have the struggle for many people is the quantitative and the fundamental analysis. So many people come to me and say, look, Greg, I don't know where to look at doing the fundamental analysis. I don't know where to find the good long and, 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 and the good short. Uh, this is something where I spend a lot of time trying to explain the 4x4 video series in the 4x4 video series. Then you have the usual stuff of technical analysis, price action, risk management, which is key. Um, why? Because I'm, I think I'm pretty boring with risk management because this is something that is key if you want to work in the industry, if you want to be successful. In, in, in managing your own money or managing someone else's money, you need to have a strong uh, um, uh, risk process, a strong risk management. And unfortunately, many, many people just think that, you know, all of this is, is good enough and, don't, and you don't need to have a risk management. And many people can have good ideas and actually they're losing money because they have a bad risk management. So that was for the 4 by 4 video series. I got a lot of interest these days because people have been struggling and are looking for a process that works. If I might help, please come to me. If you have questions, um, I, I might be able to answer those uh, questions. So let's go into the, the next part of the slide, which is the Q&A. So I ask you during the week, uh, if you had questions, I'll try to jump later on the question and answer, but let's start with this one, uh, which is, you know, what are the market drivers? So the first thing is pretty obvious. Uh, uh, the market has always different, uh, uh, is always looking at different uh, drivers, different catalysts. So if you think about what is happening these days, is you sh we, sh we should all be uh, looking at the coronavirus numbers, you know, uh, that would be in Europe, that would be more importantly in the US and how uh, the pandemic could grow in the US or not. Um, and that means that any single, uh, on any single day, you need to know when are uh, the, the numbers coming. Um, then you need to be, uh, uh, to be looking at the credit market. Why? Because as I said, the whole downfall, the whole sell-off started on the credit market. There is a lot of stress in the credit market. And if we don't solve, or uh, if the Fed is not solving this credit, issue, then we're going to be at risk. Um, and, and so we are deleveraging. I think the deleveraging is still on. I think people are still str struggling. If you think about this, uh, real people in real world will need some cash and they will need to sell assets in the next couple of months. So that means that will put pressure in uh, any financial market. So what will be, in your opinion, an indicator to watch for an eventual resell off? So as I said, I want to be looking at the WTI because WTI is, is telling me at the moment that uh, 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 the market is pricing uh, GDP to collapse. And, and at the moment, there is not expecting any bonds. But I will be looking at any credit market, uh, um, like high yield, uh, like uh, um, uh, spread between Italy and, and, and the bond, if we, if we were looking about Europe. I will be looking at, um, at mini market in the US, how single names have been trading in the US, uh, both, uh, let's say, uh, double A, triple B, uh, from high quality to low quality. So try to monitor uh, the credit market, uh, because as I've tried to show you uh, with uh, the graph of the S&P and the credit market, there is massive, massive correlation. Um, so there was, a, I had another question about uh, example of riding or not the bonds. And here, um, the thing is here, you, by definition with such high volatility, you have to reduce exposure. Okay, so you, you move from being a portfolio manager to being a trader and you want, you don't want to be trading the market in between. Okay, so if you don't have a view, you don't trade the market. So what I've been doing over the last, five sessions to give you an indication. I've been trading FX, which I do once every three to six months because FX for me is extremely boring. So I took profit in, in my dollar uh, sterling. So uh, as I said, I was long the dollar, short sterling, and I, and I, um, I started at 120, 118, 160. So I end up with 118.3 as, as, as profit. Then I traded, I, traded uh, I mentioned that to another one of my mentees, 
I traded core uh, majors. Core majors, which was total uh, core because I like the stock and, and I could see bonds. But then, and I can show you the, the, the chart that um, uh, I've been trading BP over the last couple of days. Uh, so where is my BP? Because there are many names. Uh, where is my BP? BP. Okay, so that's BP. Why I'm trading BP? Um, and if you look at the chart, and here I do chart. Okay, so my reasoning is it sold off on the gap 346. So as long as it's be below 346, I think it could go lower. And I have a very easy way to put a hard stop loss. So what is my downside? If I go short between 340 and 346, you know, at 352, 353, I'm gonna be using my, uh, my, my hard stop loss, which is, you know, between two and 4% hard stop loss with actually being able to trade the position several times. And that is the possible upside, which is a, a downside on the chart. But you could do exactly the same with some other majors like Total in France, uh, where is my total? Because I'm gonna have many names. Total. Uh, I hate this website. It's uh, not the website. Total. Okay, so that's the same. That's exactly the same chart. Okay, same chart. So you need to pick one name. You don't have to to be picking 15 names. You pick one name, and across. And this is why I've been repeating myself over the last 10 days to European sectors and US sectors. You need to be looking through the sectors and saying, okay, what is the sector telling me chart-wise? And then, you know, I find the stocks and what are the stocks telling me uh, chart-wise? So here you're gonna be doing active trading. In between, you know, between the noise of the S&P, I'm really struggling. I might go for, for uh, putting a big position? No, you want to be positioned 10, 20, 30% net position. Uh, uh, at best. Question, the next question is which is, um, so you can see it and I need to go back here, which is the very cost-effective and little time-consuming strategy to edge against tail risks, market drawdown of 30%. So you probably saw the headlines of Bill Ackman uh, who last week said that we need to close the market and this week said that he made a fortune 2.5 billion um, having hedges. The reality is when you are playing a crash scenario, you want to be most of the time being buying a, a put crash. When you buy put crash, when you buy options, what you want to be doing is buying those options or those protections or you know those, those downside when implied volatility is low. So I go back to one of the slides before, when the VIX, which is the implied volatility is at 60%, it's quite expensive to be buying, to be long options. So you don't have any incentive now to be buying. I mean, you, I mean, you might have if the market is down 60%, okay? But still the risk reward is not great at this level because the implied volatility is already too high. But in a normal situation, and that was what I was advocating six weeks ago and before. If you have a long a book of, let's say 100 long, if you can buy a put at 15% implied volatility with a crash scenario, you know that if the market crash by 20, 30%, you're gonna be perfectly hedged on your whole book, okay? And you don't only need to put two to 5% of your book. So this is the beauty of, the, uh, uh, the put crash, and this is why uh, some hedge funds have been, have been doing so well uh, uh, over the last six weeks, because if you do, when you're making PNL, you allocate two to 3% of this PNL to put crash. And when it happens, you're gonna be making 20, 30 times your money on those put crash. And this is not only for the S&P, this is across asset classes, okay? Next question is about what do I think about gold as a diversifier in a portfolio? So I look at gold as um, any, anything in my asset class. Um, and, and, and why I'm saying that, because I mentioned that uh, uh, several times for the people who follow me, 
I think it was in 2018, one of my mentees came to me and, uh, and GLD uh, gold was at uh, 1300. And he said, look, Greg, I want to be long gold. I don't have the timing. I don't know how to do it. And I said, okay, what about we look at options, but long dated options. And we look, I think it was January 2021 options. And that was cool. And it was, the implied volatility was at 10 or 11%. So literally you had to be break even, that was in 2018, you had to see the gold moving from 130 to 137 over the, le the, ne the, the next three years. And obviously gold went up another 20%. So I look at gold as, you know, a way to protect yourself. What I don't like in the gold is I think there are too many retail traders into it. And I think what we've seen uh, uh, recently, if you think about the first move on the gold, which was people going for say kind of safe haven, gold going up. Then when there's a stress in the market, actually gold is not making its, its job because people just need to sell it because actually, most retail traders are long the gold and because they are they might be so bad at generating ideas and having a peer book they are having margin calls so they need to sell gold so gold went down and the only reason here was because of, of the physical so gold might be part of your portfolio management what i strongly advise you to be looking and, and, and checking is the uh, uh, commitment of traders positioning uh, that's going to tell you how uh, uh, the market is positioned and if it's uh, uh, if people are uh, uh, the speculators are very long or not so that's helpful uh, but to me the, the real question about gold is more you know is there any uh, better real assets okay and if i think about real assets there are better real assets than gold uh, stuff that i will be happy to be long because if that's the end of the world, okay, what am I gonna do with my gold? I'm not sure I'm gonna do much, uh, except you know, looking at my gold and saying, look, I'm very rich. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, um, I look at gold like any other asset class, and this is it. Um, so next one on the VIX, uh, at this point of our lives, and with the VIX so high, is it recommended to put spread trades or should we wait for the VIX to drop less than 20%? So that was yesterday. I don't know where is the 22% coming from. Uh, I know, we know now, you know now that the VIX is at 90% uh, on average. Um, so if we go for options here, if we go long options, we go long premium at a very high level. So you're better off uh, going for the underlying with small size because the data today showed that you know six seven eight percent you're going to do enough move and not be looking at the VIX. spread trades yes you always need to be uh, uh, in a book and this is what i try to to help you with the four by four video series in a portfolio you need to have different uh, um, um, strategies different assets and different time frame so what you're going to have is you're going to have a core of, of, of across sectors and intra sector of pair trade, which are going to make 10, 50% of your book, depending on the market's condition. Then the rest is going to be active trading, special situation and so forth. But the thing is these days, when you enter a position, if your position normally is 10,000 versus 10,000, you need to do 5,000 versus 5,000. And probably what you're going to have is you're not going to be able to be hedging yourself through put options or through calls, whatever. So that is really a problem these days, how you hedge yourself when on the single name when the implied volatility is at 60%. So that means you need to reduce. And I think what is key is, is you don't want to be stuck with you know the uh, magic formula, which is a bad magic formula saying, oh, VIX is above 22%, so I'm not doing anything. There is a lot, there are many opportunities here. And when I say that, it's easy for me to say because, you know, it's a bit of back trading. And, and from one week to another telling you, oh, the, the S&P is up, you should have been doing this and this. But the reality, there are opportunities, okay? The thing is, as long as you get a good risk management, you should be able to do it. Uh, next question about fundamental analysis. 
So is fundamental analysis relevant in these high volatile times to generate IDs? And what are the criteria for ID generation? So when I started to work, that was in 2000, I was, I just finished um, business school in France and I was like, um, I didn't know much like anyone after school. And uh, I started to trade uh, French market, US markets. And literally 2020, uh, 2000, 2001, there was a spike in volatility. And, and, and in terms of fundamental, I was literally garbage. Uh, but very quickly, I understood that if you want to hold the position longer and all short, you need to get some of the fundamental analysis. So the whole concept of, of, of the four by four video series of the whole mentoring program is not to be the best analyst, is not to be the best uh, technical analyst, but at least you want to have the basics right. If you don't have them, if you don't understand what is a balance sheet, for instance, you're gonna be lost. And why I'm saying that these days, criteria for ID generation. We know that the risk these days is on the balance sheet, is on the credit. So if you want to do a filtering, and this is something that I've been doing with some of my mentees these days, is the first thing that we do always is we look at the concept of enterprise value. What is enterprise value? That is the market cap plus the cash, minus, uh, plus the debt minus the cash. If you don't understand that the company has a lot of debt and might be at risk because of its debt, then you have no chance. And it doesn't matter if your time frame is one minute or two years. And here in terms of ID generation, at the moment, right now, I'm looking at the company's you know, balance sheet, how they are able to generate free cash flow, how uh, uh, sustainable those free cash flow are. And I'll be looking across industries um, so to give you an example, a couple of days ago, one of my mentees who started the mentoring program last week, um, very smart guy, he came and he came with this uh, US company and some of, some of you will have a, a natural, you know, capacity of, of, of finding stock. And he came to me with uh, this company which has a, a, a high leverage, uh, debt on EBDA around five, five times. And naturally we know that, that that could be a possible great short. Why? Because this company has to pay back its debt. We know that the free cash flow is not gonna come. So unless you know the, the world will start very quickly, they're gonna be struggling. And here, this is fundamental analysis that you always should be doing. So why I've been so pushing so hard over the last couple of weeks into the price action, because price action is telling you something plus price action these days because of these big moves is offering great opportunities. So when I do a blog on price action on US stocks, then on European uh, companies across the sectors, because my experience that in a market like this, just by looking at the sectors, you're going to find many opportunities. Of course, here we are trading opportunities. I'm not saying that this position I'm gonna keep them for the rest of my life. When I trade total, you know, I traded total twice last week and I hold the position for a couple of days. Two days ago and today I traded uh, uh, BP on the day, okay? It's, it's about making 5%. I'm not saying that in, I'm there for the next 20%. When the volatility, when the VIX is gonna, uh, is gonna come down, then I'm gonna be building my portfolio again. But at the moment, there are many opportunities, right? So let's start to see if you have, uh, how do you see that the market is short or long demo? So how do you see that the market is short or long demo? So what you need to be doing, uh, which is not easy, but there are some websites uh, that you can be using, is more or less, you're gonna, it's not more or less, you need to be calculating for the different uh, expiry uh, the SPY, the S&P, uh, or, or everything that is related to the index, you will be doing the open interest time the gamma, time the last. And that's what going to give you to the call and the put, the overall uh, gamma positioning of the market. And depending of the gamma positioning, uh, that should uh, 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 tell you about the possible uh, uh, direction of the market. Keeping in mind that here, 
everything has been distorted by the new player, which is the Fed. Okay. Could you please give a short term idea about another sector as well? Uh, so, uh, oil, I think you should be looking at oil, as I've been saying, uh, the majors. Um, so, Angel, if you want to be looking at ideas that could work, I strongly advise you to be looking at stocks that have been uh, 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 bouncing quite a lot and have, that are very close to the levels that there were uh, before the sell-off. Why you want to do that? Because you know that you can be using a, a, a tight stop loss and actually uh, the downside if the market sells off again uh, could be significant. And um, I'm not going to give you the name, but if you look at some European banks and maybe some French banks, you can find one or two names that could be interesting to, uh, to, to short. Um, what else do I have? Um, do you expect a lower low, at least a retest since economic data is most likely to get worse? Uh, market will question someday the effectiveness of those fiscal and monetary measurements. So um, le le let's start with, with, with Q. So uh, yesterday I tweeted that, you know, Q is working. Um, that was a joke, obviously. Q is working for uh, 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 when there is a time like this, when there is a dislocation and, and it helps mainly uh, Wall Street and it helps bailing out those companies. In the long run, there are massive diminishing returns and it's really, really not working in the long run. So to me, as a um, French and being as a socialist, it's quite funny to see the US going for full socialist bazooka, uh, buying and doing QE massively. Uh, and, and they are following uh, Japan. Does it work? No, it doesn't work. I, I, I'm not saying that uh, 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 the central banks should have not be jumping. I think they did a great job and, and, and we are lucky that they jump into they jumped here because we needed liquidity. We, we really needed, you know, uh, especially when the world is collapsing, you don't want to. So you want the central banks to be doing their jobs as providing liquidity and being the, the, the plumbers. Having said that, I'm not a big fan of QE. And because there are, as I said, diminishing returns. So the question here is uh, uh, with this pandemic, which is noble story, the coronavirus is how long it's going to last. Uh, if, if it's last, um, uh, uh, and it's going to last more than one to three months. Okay. So if you look at China, as I said, Italy and other factors, it's going to take some time for, uh, for people to uh, go back outside again. So that means the economies worldwide and despite uh, uh, um, the G7, G8, whatever commitment of putting 5 trillion into the economies, 5 trillion is probably 5% of the world GDP. So that's, that's, that's good, but that's in the same time, that's a, a source, that's peanuts because the world GDP might be collapsing by 10, 20%, okay? Uh, 10, 20%, that's just a huge number. So what we're gonna see in the next few months, in the next few weeks is uh, the real economy uh, uh, that it, that, that's gonna be struggling. Uh, pretty soon we're going to have the earnings season and that means the earnings season is going to be bringing even more um, um, uh, uh, volatility. So let's go. So Louis, what's the name of that chart's Twitter account? Uh, so that's uh, the marketeer. marketeer. So send me a, 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 an email and I will reply to you. In these market conditions, do you still look at leading indicators and generate ideas from surveys? So a very good question. So the ISM manufacturing and services, obviously we all know that they're gonna be horrendous, okay? So as, as what you want to be doing is thinking about how long the recession can last. As I said, the average recession is around 11 months, okay? So if we have 11 months, we know that we're going to see we're going to see probably a, a, a bottom in the ism manufacturing and services um, and that means you need to be looking at the sectors 
Again, this is something that I cover massively in the 4x4 video series and I repeat myself and but the market's conditions and where you are in the cycle. Depending where you are in the economic cycle, you're going to allocate your money differently across sectors okay, and across asset classes. So that's something. And why I've done so, because if you think about it, when I built the product was in 2019, six months ago, and I knew that uh, that would be important because we were really getting closer to the end of the cycle uh, and why as well because the whole idea is i don't want my subscribers to be only making money for six months then when there is a hiccup they'll be losing 50 percent uh, uh, so when trading a long short portfolio would you recommend being net short in your accounts i don't recommend anything you do <laughs> you do whatever you want um that's it's um I mean, there are levels, there are, uh, um, my job is not to give you levels, okay? My job is, I don't have a job, but uh, uh, is trying to help you having a process and you do whatever you want with it. We all get different time frames. We all get different, you know, uh, uh, portfolio size. Um, what I can tell you is the rally that we have today and this week, is because there is a lot of flow coming into the into the market okay so in terms of real economy the economy is is, is struggling but it's going to struggle even more okay so 26 30 26 50 is the first level then the next one is 27 50 okay in between you know if it opens uh, uh, uh if it opens up four percent tomorrow what do you do with it and my problem here is again you can't go to options okay uh, when trading, you advise again option strategies where we sell a higher strike call against a long CFD position. I mean, those, those strategy about, um, uh, 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 so you long the stock and you're selling the options and you want to believe that you're making a fortune because you're selling the options. If you think about it, if you've done that, let's say a couple of days ago, and the market in between is up 10%. Uh, that means you gave up all the upside. So in a sense, if you've been in the story for long enough, you lost 30%, and then you lock up your loss down 20%, and now it's going up, it's going up without you. So all those strategy, which is, you know, on paper looks really good, where you say, oh, I'm selling these options, so I'm cashing in X percent. The reality is, look, at uh, the payoff okay how much you're gonna make and the reality is you're capping your upside and i think in a market like this you know when there is huge volatility you want to be able to be catching those abnormal moves if you say from day one i'm i'm sitting on this abnormal move i'm kind of a bit of struggling um so open interest, uh, so you need to be looking at options. I think it's a bit basic, but if you want to be looking at open interest, you need to be looking at the four by four videos. Is this rebalancing covered in your course? Uh, I think I touched base on this. Um, I'm not sure that I have the Excel. I don't have the Excel spreadsheet, but I touched base, yes, on, on the end of the month. Uh, that is something that I cover. Do you think this Fed and rebalancing could just be causing a non-fundamental bear market rally? Yes, I mean, it is creating a, 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 a bear market rally. There's no point, there, there is no doubt about it. The question is, you know, there is so, so much liquidity. And as someone was saying on Twitter, I think it was Bianco or whatever, we are nationalizing the credit market, okay? So in a sense, you know, it, you can do, they could be cornering the market and buying whatever they want, especially as now they are working with BlackRock. So BlackRock could be buying anything they want, ETF. Now they can even be buying ETF credit, which is absolutely insane. So next, next move, what you, you buy from the stocks. Uh, so at the end of every quarter, especially in the last week, you say be long as they have to rebalance. No, this is not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not about being long. You need to be looking at the performance on the months of the bonds versus the stocks or the stocks versus the bonds. And if there is a huge delta between the two, five days before the close, there is the close of the months, there is a good chance that there is a reversion to the mean. But it's not like every end 
five days, uh, five sessions before the end of the month, you have to be buying. So you need to be looking at the performance on the month and on the quarter. What is your opinion about continuing shorting European banks? Um, by European banks, um, if you think, if you read about what the Fed, the, the ECB did last week, it was extremely, extremely helpful for, for the banks. And I've been saying that from day one. Okay, uh, because of cheering, because more cheering, because of better access to cheap financing. So actually, uh, I read somewhere from a smart guy that uh, these, uh, not the ECB, um, uh, any banks could be uh, uh, borrowing money at the ECB at negative yields and, and putting all their money with, at BTP, which is at 1.5%. So you could could be making let's say 150 to 200 bits for free for size so that is what the dcb is offering uh, uh, to the banks these days <laughs> how do you generate shorts when stocks are all down big um i mean uh, it's like uh, longs uh, longs or shorts you need to do your homework uh, and again uh, yesterday when i did this mentoring uh, 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 session with my mentee with, who is only in session number two and he came with great ideas of short. The thing is, what we ex need to be extremely careful and I think where many retail traders are losing is to have an idea or reading an headline and thinking this is a trade. Here you have something that is key is can I, uh, key these days is what is the price action the technical analysis and the implied volatility telling me, and can I do my risk management? So we can have a shitload of ideas saying the market is gonna up X percent or down X percent. If you can't put the trade, sit on your hand. There is no problem. You know me, I'm, I'm these days, you know, I do FX, I do uh, uh, so, uh, some BP, I'm gonna do some total because there are opportunities and if in two weeks time there are more to come i'm going to try to be monitoring now the s p to see if there is level if the price action goes my way i'm going to go short 20 30 percent between that you know i'm really really struggling to do my risk management uh quick question regarding risk in credit markets since the fed has announced the bazooka and is essentially providing unlimited bids how do you define the risk then where do you see the risk I think the risk on that one is, is, is a very good question, uh, Oliver. I think the question is um, when you start to see defaults coming in real economy. So if you think about, uh, for instance, if you look about, about Italy, what are gonna be doing in the non-performing loans? If you think about the US, what are gonna be the defaults on credit cards? What are gonna be the defaults on, uh, auto, uh, on auto loans? That means, the real, the real economy uh, uh, that companies are going to be struggling. So you need to be looking at the effects of the real economy into the credit market. So far, what the Fed did is, if you think about it, all the bonds were trading at 100. Uh, 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 and then they, they traded at 80 cents on the dollar. So the market started to get scared and the Fed said, we need really to do something quickly. So what they did, is they did, uh, they put a floor on the whole credit market. So they were on the bid, 80 everywhere. So they said MBS credit ETF, we go at 80 cents, okay? But then, you know, you can be, uh, uh, which is a good thing in a sense because uh, uh, the market was under a massive uh, distress. So, sorry for the, the noise in the background, but a, a lot of stress. So you put the normal, the, the Fed did his normal job, which is, putting liquidity and, and helping market participants having a, a, a system working. Now, if you go into the recession and a possible depression, that means you're gonna start to see companies default. If you start to see company default, defaulting, that means uh, banks who are holding, uh, uh, who are long loans, who are long assets, will see those assets coming down. And this is where you see the domino effect. Assuming global uh, markets remain challenging, do you expect global demand for USD in flight for safety will drive dollar higher? As I said, um, last week, uh, dollar swap, and I said that during the call last week, was very significant from, from the Fed. 
I think what with what they did um, this Monday with uh, Infinite uh, QE, they could do the same with Infinite uh, uh, USD, USD swap. Uh, so they'll, they'll stand ready. Um, anything we can do in the USA, like BP or Total? Um, yes, there is many, many things you can do. Uh, <laughs> there are many good stories to logo long and go short. Uh, and here you need to do some screening, as I said, look at free cash flow, look at balance sheet, uh, look at sectors, because you're gonna have sectors that are gonna be absolutely destroyed, okay? So if you think about sectors that have many employees, if you think about sectors that have uh, where there is social distancing, all those sectors are gonna suffer big time. And not necessarily the first one, you could be looking at what I really like when I do ID generation is the second derivatives. Um, if, if I start with $50,000, uh, what position? Is every, isn't everything in the P ratio? <laughs> isn't everything in the P ratio? Okay, I, I know where you come from uh, and I know you're wrong and you know you're wrong. So it's not all about the P ratio. P ratio is really misleading. Unfortunately, many of you are still only looking at P ratio. If you do the four by four video series, if you do the mentoring with me, you will understand that P ratio is really, really misleading. And it's, it's nice to be talking about P ratio, uh, but it's it's, really, really misleading. So if you think about that, you should have been long PE stocks at 50 and above and short uh, 10 and below, uh, you'll be completely wrong. Um, to generate ideas like your man did is discovered in the four by four. Obviously it is, of course it is. This is really the whole idea of the four by four video series is giving you a process from the beginning to the end and give you all the tools to do it uh, through Excel and everything. So it's not like trying uh, uh, to be uh, missing some part for you to struggle. There is everything and not everything because there is nothing everything. But I try to do my best and this is why as well I'm doing this webinar because I want to uh, consolidate um, those uh, 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 knowledge. Can I generate? Uh, okay, we are almost 90 minutes. Um, let's, uh, when being a trader at home, how do you avoid just sitting at the screen? How long do you spend at the screen? Okay, that's a good question because I've done both. Okay, so I've done many, many years hedge fund prop trading and I've done as well trading at home. And my philosophy is when you trade at home uh, alone, you need to be extremely careful. So these days I'm lucky because I'm busy as well with my kids, okay? Uh, <laughs> because there is no school. So I'm doing half half and I'm doing, you know, the webinar, I'm doing the end of the session for the US, I'm doing the opening uh, in Europe. And, and I have, that means I'm not as ag uh, aggressively trading as I used to. And that's a good thing because actually I have good returns. But you know, what you need, I think what is key is, is, is and I always say that during the mentoring program is don't force the trade, okay? Don't force the trade. Um, that is really something where people are struggling where, uh, uh, and I can see that today, uh, or let's say the last three days, where if you are sitting on your hands, neutral and the market is down is up 10 percent you're going to see a lot of noise because 99 percent of the world is long on this so 99 percent of the world is going to tell you ah, <laughs> i told you the market is up 10 percent so you're going to be frustrated so you need to find ways of of not forcing the trade and this is the, the really really the hardest part uh, be careful of not forcing the trade what do i do is sometimes you're going to fail Okay, sometimes, but you need to find your own, let's say, ways of, uh, of, of avoiding those, those uh, fear of missing out. And when I say fear of missing out is long and short. So you need to have a strong risk management. Okay, you need to make sure that you're not going to fuck up uh, with your risk management. Um, on, on, on the rebalance, um, I'm not going to re-explain uh, re again. Um, uh, um, I should probably do a video, uh, a video uh, dedicated to the four by four video series. Um, on 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 the the stimulus, uh, 
but we may not end up with the demand. So yes, the stimulus is, is mainly for supply and, and clearly, yes, Ligon, uh, the, the problem is on the demand uh, side. And WTI is a very good example. Uh, oil demand is down 20%. Um, and it's even more important because if you think about the US, which makes uh, where consumption is making 70% of the GDP, if demand is vanishing, then we're gonna, they're gonna have a big problem. And that means this is why quickly, this is why the Trump administration want people to go back at work quickly. They want confidence to go back because if the consumer is not there, the whole US economy is just going through the window. Uh, serious question, why don't mentors or educators ever release their track records? So we have an idea of how your educators have performed. I mean, yes, I mean, this is a good question. If you, if you ask me um, up to, let's say the end of 2005, uh, 2005, 2015, um, I was making between, let's say, 8, 15 percent every year. 2016, 2017, I did zero, zero percent, okay? So my worst year over the last 15 years has been 2017, which where I was down three percent. When you have a track record like mine, this track record is normally uh, only when you want to raise money, okay? My philosophy and is for you to be making, like me, 5 to 15%. So some of you will say 15% is not good enough. If you can make 5, 15% over time, it, it, it's perfectly fine, okay? Um, so um, uh, the track record, you know, if you have been working for prop trading for 10 years, and when I was working for prop trading, I didn't have any salary, okay? So everything was coming from my p &L. So if I was not making money, if I was not making those returns, I will be living uh, uh, outside and I have kids. So trust me, um, or trust me or don't, um, this is not the point. Uh, um, I've been working in the industry for 18 years. For the last couple of years, my philosophy has been to be working hard on the mentoring and the content. And I don't think that you can be doing in a good way, both the mentoring and the training. I'll give you an example. If I do mentoring at, let's say 10 o'clock in the morning with someone in Australia or in Asia and someone the, and, my market, and the market is moving big time and I have 10 positions, my mentoring is gonna be rubbish because I don't have the time to dedicate time to this mentee and I'll be looking at my portfolio. And I used to do that and my, Philosophy has been, you know, dedicate time, at least the last, the last couple of years on mentoring to give you more color. I reopened a trading account with Interactive Broker at the end of January because I wanted to go back into trading. Okay, this, that was something that I wanted. But for two years, I didn't trade that much. Okay, because, you know, I traded for 18 years. I think I got an interesting question. <laughs> Show me the money uh from Frika, but you know the amf introduction of their short position today uh between the 18 march of uh, 13 16 of april so Frika, you will probably know or don't know that um actually those restrictions uh, from the regulators very often if you are working for hedge fund it's not that you don't care but the thing is very often you work with cfds and in CFDs, you know, you can go through uh, because it's not like uh, uh, the stock. So I think the reaction of, of, of you know, uh, um, uh, interdiction of net short, uh, of, of, of short sell is never a good idea. And that I understand that there is pressure on the market. Um, but to, again, if you put everything into perspective, 98 to 99% of the world is long only people. Okay, 98% of the world want all the assets to go up. How many people are really short the market, except some hedge fund and some retail traders, but not that much. So if you think that these one to 2% are in a position to destroy a market, that tells you how bad the market is. So I, I, I really don't like um, um, when we, we do a, 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 a short uh, ban. Um, 
what else do we have the fed in buying whole futures okay i take the next two then this is it uh interactive brokers light i don't know i just use interactive brokers plain vanilla i like i like interactive interactive brokers very much as i said you know in one of my webinar is because if you want to be working in the industry if you want even if you want to be raising money uh, as they are offering a good track record uh this is um this is good enough uh this is a standard for the industry you don't need to be using some dodgy or so some, some second hand interactive broker uh, so-called um, just surprised that people uh, are still offering those products um, what will be a good year for me five hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars you see my friend it depends where you put your your um your target um i'll say you know if if again if you can make consistently five fifteen percent every year and then if you have years where you make 30 percent 40 percent when you have a good year and when you have a bad year you only lose five percent that's good but what i don't want people to have is telling me look i'm making 30 percent then six months later they are down 20 percent so again it's it's i can be a guy that uh, uh, had a long only uh, story uh, um, and bought the market three days ago looked like a genius. If he had done the same at the start of this year, he's done 20 to 30 percent. So think about you know being making money consistently over time. It's not like you know it's it, this is why it is so hard because it, it's all I mean it's it's relentless. Okay, it's it's always every day you go for a fight. Um, how do you go about raising money if one makes one two years of five fifteen percent with good risk management? I think, Alexander, if you want to do that, you need, uh, if you want to raise money or if you want to be working for a prop shop or a hedge fund, you probably need 80 to 24 months of track record. When you have this track record, and when I say not track records on an Excel spreadsheet and not on the paper trade, but like real money with interactive broker, then you have a chance uh, to get a book. Small book, maybe, but you have a chance. Um, and, and uh, uh, but you know, 18 24 months because that will give you enough time to see if your strategy is working and how more importantly the first thing that someone will be looking normally in the business and i'm not thinking about you know some funny educator is not necessarily the pnl is how the pnl is over time and how you deal with risk management okay if i talk about uh, uh, um, the prop trading shop that I've been working in London for 10 years, the first thing that the partners will be asking to someone, they will be looking at the trades, the PNL, and they will be looking about the whole strategy and see how uh, uh, um, your sharp ratio, how volatile you have been, what is your max drawdown, what is your normal size position. Uh, and that means the first thing that you do when you are a hedge fund manager or a prop trader you are a risk manager and people just want to believe that you know it's about only finding ideas and 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 this is first and foremost about risk management okay uh what else do we have i think this is it um yeah uh probably this is it need to go me too um so i'll try to do another one next week because i think the weekly session works um if you have questions uh, in between send me an email um, as i said i'm trying to do a lot of things around price action because doing something about price action a couple of months ago was completely pointless whereas these days is very important think about the flows um think about being flexible uh, don't put too much gross and net exposure. Here we had like a very strong week in terms of inflows and in terms of uh, uh, central banks and governments helping the market. But now we are uh, going into uh, the important phase, which is, you know, if it's going to work and how the economy is going to uh, sustain the pain or not. Um, thank you very much i hope you enjoyed it i enjoyed it very much um talk to you soon again send me an email if you have any question good night everyone be safe bye bye